Well, welcome to our webinar. Uh, we're talking today about remodels. Uh, this pace of rebound and decline that we're seeing right now, a really interesting story setting up. And then something else that we're calling the great channel reorder. Uh, we think it's it's important. You probably have some sense of the shifting uh, pro-contractor activity that's going on. There's a lot more to that. And we think it's got more implications coming. So uh, we're going to take you through this discussion. Uh, before we get into that, a plug for some several things for Zonda that's important for you to know. Let me just click on this here. Uh, first of all, building products outlook. If the type of material that we're going through today, forecast, including home improvement and remodeling forecast by price point, uh, channel pro and DIY activity and uh, I implications for uh, like pro contractors and brands, if that's useful to you, uh, we have a subscription that gives you the access to all of our best ideas. And that's here. So you can go ahead and you'll, you'll have the opportunity to fill out a survey later on if you're interested in learning more about that. Um, but uh, we're, we're continuing to learn as the, the market continues to unfold. And this is where we capture all of those learnings as real time, as, as the data rolls in. So pretty interesting place. Uh, if you need work on any custom assignments, uh, we have an entire advisory team that all we do is spend our time trying to peel back the layers on uh, various issues, everything from building product forecasts to things in the housing space, including uh, everything from land land analysis to single family build for rent, you name it, it's all here, but we have a team that works on that. So you can reach out to us if you need that. We also have uh, incredibly unique data relating to housing supply. Uh, and I'm talking like within the Metro, exactly how many homes are in the pipeline by price point, who's building them, who are the contacts, all the types of questions that uh, I kind of wished I would have had access to when I was in the building product forecasting space uh, at one of the big manufacturers years ago. Uh, we have that here. So if your team needs that, uh, you have the opportunity to reach out to us then. And just so it's on your radar, uh, we do offer market snapshots. These are metro level forecast and analysis for a number of different markets. Uh, you can get a free market if you'd like to have access here at zondahome.com slash market snapshot. Download it there. Uh, nice write-up, 65 markets. We're going to have more too. Uh, and then just two more fun things. If you haven't seen the concept home by Livable, it's a pretty exciting process. There is a number of uh, large builders, some of the top architects, some of the top building product companies got together and essentially came up with a virtual concept home that works anywhere, depending on your lifestyle. Really fun process, but you need to take a look at it. You can take a look at it at 2024conceptthome.com. And related to that, that was sponsored by Livable. Livable just launched uh, several months ago. It's Zonda's reimagined listing service. It's enormous. It's got all the power of Zonda's new home database, but it's designed to actually help builders uh, sell homes to, to the end consumer. So it's B2C. Super interesting. I'm excited to watch this, and we're going to learn a lot there, too. So let's get into our discussion. Oh, we have a, one last thing, upcoming events. If you're going to be in any of these locations, Denver, uh, Tampa, Arlington, Dallas, and any of these dates, uh, these are super useful events, including Builder Connections and Future Place that you should have on your radar. Of course, if you'd like to learn more, there's a website, zondahome.com slash events that you can go and sign up. So let's get into our discussion. We've got four important things we want to talk through today. Uh, I'm going to begin by talking about the shift that's gone in backlogs since the beginning of the year. Uh, it's obviously changed the environment for pro building products, including new construction and home improvement. But that also reflects itself in pricing power. We're going to touch that up front. Then we're going to talk about this debate between demand pull forward or deferral. And I'm going to show you several factors that are not being talked about. We're not going to go through the ones that everyone knows, like age of the housing stock and what's going on with uh, credit and some of those other conditions. Those are obvious. We're going to go through some that we don't think you've heard about but need to be on your radar and also help us kind of uh, have greater conviction around our view of how this is going to play out. Uh, then, I, I don't know if you saw the results from the big box retailers, but it, an important story that's happening right now is this shift, this battleground about where the pro contractor is going for home improvement projects. We think that's shifting right now. We've got tremendous data on this, and the evidence is really coming together right in front of our nose that 2023 is uh, uh, the, the year of that shift. We're going to talk about this channel reorder. And then we're going to show you the implications next on what the implications are we think 
between what could happen with this channel shift, then in turn driving shifts within the brands. So lots of interesting layers that we need to go through. To begin, here's what we talked about several months ago, early 2023. So to recap, risks to building product revenue, culminating, getting worse in the second half of 2023, which I think was fairly contrarian at the time. The view was that things were going to get worse. The consensus view was things were going to be worse in the first half of 2023 and then get better. Uh, I have seen some data points that there's sequential improvement uh, month over month. Even the starts number that came out today was pretty nice. Uh, but we think this still holds true. And in tied to that, minus 7 to minus 9% building product revenue down this year, that's with about minus 17 to minus 20% decline in starts. But the story there is going to be second half, second half weakness, which we think is underrated right now. Uh, longer term, we think the decade of 2020 to 2030 that we are in right now, the, the decade that will be remembered as the golden age of remodeling. So we're talking about a level uh, increase in the levels of home improvement spending, but with a pretty nasty cyclical slowdown in the middle. And that's what we're at right now. Uh, which means there's all sorts of implications for product pricing and all sorts of implications for supply chains. I've heard people say supply chains are fixed. I agree supply chains have adjusted to the lower level of demand, but that's different than saying supply chains are fixed if we get a rebound. And then lastly, this is going to get into our channel reorder discussion. Uh, we said this several months ago that we thought the ingredients were right for this divergence in results between channels and brands. That's absolutely starting to play out right now. So here's an update on how we think right now uh, a little bit more detail. So let's talk about short-term versus medium-term and then some other issues. So short-term, we still believe conditions will get incrementally worse in the second half of 2023. And some of the issues are uh, we started the year with a strong backlog of uh, projects, both on the new and on the home improvement side. That will have largely burned off by the second half of 2023. And I'm going to show you the data on this in a minute. We also have this potential second wave of destocking which matters a lot. We already saw one wave of that happen earlier this year. Uh, we think there could be another. Uh, this credit is tightening pretty rapidly, especially on kind of the, the risk on and deeper stage uh, access to credit for both building products, as well as some of the kind of upstream development. Uh, that's going to impact home improvement, especially some of the big project spending uh, later on this year. And uh, we've talked about this before. I'll touch on it today. Uh, there's been this backlog of excess savings that's been built up coming into 2023 that's now being drawn down. That's basically changing the legs, we think, on when the normal macro impact hits the, the, the broader market. That's starting to play out now. So we'll talk about that. Uh, and then you need to have this on your radar. Whatever your starts forecast is for next year, the timing and the, the amount of building product revenue that will be going to multifamily next year in 2024 you should be bringing it down, especially in the first half of the year. It could be a pretty rough uh, multifamily print for BP companies. So they're getting that revenue now. It's looking really, really strong now. They're thinking they're gaining market share because they're seeing leg multifamily orders. That's going to reverse by this time next year. So it needs to be on your radar. So those are short-term issues that are real issues that we're, we're dealing with head on. They're going to impact the second half of this year. We've also got some pretty interesting kind of medium, longer-term issues that uh, offset that that we think is going to cause either a deferral uh, or a bounce. So we'll spend some time talking about this deferral or pull forward debate. We think there was some pull forward in some of the outdoor projects and minor, minor updates. I'm talking about like updating a bedroom into an office for work for home, that type of thing, or some your kids spending a little bit more time at home. But beyond that, we think there's a strong case to be made that a large amount of remodeling, especially the largest projects, were mostly deferred, and that will rebound uh, as soon as we see prices stabilize, which is happening, but importantly, rates beginning to ease. So we, that, that's a separate conversation. Uh, there's also this matching problem of homeowners that basically bought a home in the last few years, and they bought a home too quickly, uh, and it, they didn't do their own diligence. Maybe they waived inspections, they didn't check the schools or the neighborhood, uh, but it seems to be a poor fit for the homes that they're in, which means they either have to move and they're stuck with a higher mortgage rate right now, or they have to remodel or both. That's definitely deferral. Uh, and then the precedent in the early 80s was that we did see deferral, especially in these more larger home improvement categories, well over 20%, in some cases 30% or more, uh, as soon as we saw rates begin to come back a fuzz. Uh, and then some other things that you need to be thinking about, I just want to touch on demographics uh, of course, demographics is really slow moving, but there's two takeaways you need to know about today's demographics that were different than prior cycles. Uh, one, 
there's a lot less downside this this cycle for housing, but also for home improvement. Uh, if we went and re had a time machine and went back to 2007 and relived 2007, but with today's demographics, we would cycle almost 400 basis points less. Uh, means less drawdown and a rap more rapid rebound. A really interesting backdrop. And then also there's this shift we're going to talk about in the birth rate. It's not overall, but it's among the exactly the right group that consumes housing, college educated women over 35. That's really bounced since 2020. That's going to have uh, pretty significant implications for all of the building product companies. And then lastly, you know, say this pretty clearly, we think the pro contractor universe, uh, I was at a conference last week and I heard leader after leader make the comment that they're just trying to, to use Ali Wolf's term, a uh, hoard labor. So there is a battle for talent going on right now, especially among professional installers and contractors. And we think the channels uh, who, who, who are battling for that talent, who can get that in the, the, those pro contractors, that will be the battleground where remodeling is won and lost and market share gains are, are won and lost also. So we're going to talk about what we're seeing going on there. So let's briefly talk about pro contract back backlogs. So pro contractors started the year with the black line. This is home improvement. Well, it includes not just home improvement, also new, but generally uh, the universe of pro contractors to start 2023 had, most contractors had over six months of backlog. Some had three to six months, but the majority of their, their, their these pro contractors started the year with just an incredible depth of backlogs, which meant they had, they had pricing power. Even if the new bids came in slower, they had enough work to keep them going. And then what we saw happen over the course of Q1 was each month when we successively measured pro contractor backlogs, we saw things get worse, like a lot worse, uh, like jobs fall off, fewer jobs come in the backlog. Uh, what, the most recent report that we sent to clients in April, or I'm sorry, in, 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 in June, um, what we learned was that pro contractors sequentially improved their backlogs from the very, very worst months of like March of this year, but the overall level of backlogs is still depleted. So it looks like it's getting better. It looks a little bit more stable than the worst it was in Q1, but the buffer's gone which means some of those macro issues will hit us more directly. So here's one metric I'm gonna share with you that I really like to look at when it comes to thinking about where the market has stabilized. So one of the most useful ways of looking at the market stabilizing is to look at when a pro contractor bids on a job. Uh, so here's kind of how the, the logic, very simply, the project gets quoted and one of two things happens. Either the consumer accepts that project immediately and they kind of, look the other way on pricing or availability. This happened under 2021. Uh, if we think about when you when you didn't have enough supply and prices were way up you know, to the moon, uh, homeowners were just happy to get a contractor in their home doing the work. So projects can be accepted or they can be pushed back. And by pushback, I mean uh, delayed in any way. We're gonna just gonna wait, we're gonna postpone, or maybe we'll reduce the scope, or maybe we'll do the same scope, but we'll, we'll shift to the, the cheapest products we can find in the home. That's all pushing back and re, kind of renegotiating the project. We like to look at the ratio uh, kind of by category of accepted projects to pushbacks because it gives us a really good gauge of what's happening within the market from a contractor and product pricing standpoint. So here's what we learn. We measure this pushback ratio in Q1. We did it every month, but we did it in Q1. And we also have a preliminary Q2 number. And for a whole number of mid-range remodels, I'm talking about like kind of HVAC systems, some flooring systems, but even some of the more larger ones like kitchen and roofing, we generally saw pro contractor uh, pricing pushback. So, you know, pushbacks per accepted bid start the year. Uh, and and in, the, in those worst months in February and March, consumers pushed back pretty actively, and now we're seeing it stabilize, which means that we think this first month, we've suddenly kind of seen pricing power reemerge and stabilize, which is good. The exception is for the most expensive remodels, additions and gut rehabs. Uh, and part of the reason for that, we believe, is because those are exactly the type of remodels that started the year with just the most enormous backlog and is now beginning to bleed down. So we're seeing the market begin to turn. The type of products that you use in additions and gut rehabs are very different than the pure play like HVAC products or the siding products. There's a lot more to them. So we're going to see a rotation happen within some of the home improvement products we think later on this year as the market continues to soften. Uh, what we think is happening 
and there's a whole lot more to this. I'm not going to talk you through what's going on with existing home sales and credit and some of these other factors that everyone thinks about. I want to point you to some factors that I think are really important now, but aren't looked at as often. So number one, arguably the most underrated but important factor for thinking about changes in spending on housing, but also home improvement, is changes in real personal income. And so that's important because for the last year plus, we've seen declines in on a trailing 12 basis of you know, year-over-year -year changes in real personal income. First, it was because of inflation, and then overall incomes begin to soften relative to that. Now we're comping the declines, and we're still declining more uh, coming into Q2, uh, which leads us to this point on the right. Uh, Larry, Larry Summers had made this comment recently that the U.S. economy could face a Wiley Coyote moment. And of course, what he was referring to is that point when, when Wiley Coyote runs off the cliff and doesn't realize it, and then suddenly free falls. Uh, we should have seen with these types of declines in real personal income, if you were building a model on this, you should have seen much more rapid declines already, already in remodeling spending. We haven't yet. We've started to see some. So what's happening? Well, part of the story is that we know that there's this excess amount of personal savings buildup that happened during 2020 and 2021. All these stimulus payments basically got stuck with people at home and they couldn't travel and they couldn't spend in other ways and they saved it. Uh, almost a year's worth of excess savings was socked aside. And so now what it seems to be happening is as we're seeing declines in real personal income, which should be directly slowing home improvement spending, but also seeing you know 30% down existing home sales and credits freezing up, and we're seeing you know some of the macro numbers. Home home prices were going down; they seem to have stabilized now. Uh, but the reason those have not impacted home improvement and some of the other housing categories as severely as they normally would have is because you had this buffer, uh, and that, that's the good news. The bad news is that the buffer won't last forever. And it'll soften, we think, by the later part of this year, which is part of the reason for our call, among several other th reasons, for the decline of risk getting worse in the second half of 2023. Okay, so that's the negative news. Let me pivot by going into the discussion. You know, there's this debate around pull forward uh, among investors versus deferral. I want to give you some things to think about, about why... I'm so convinced, and we don't have time to even go into to many of them. These are just a few high points that I think are not being talked about that you need to have on your radar that support the bounce, support the deferral story. So uh, first of all, let's just talk about the, the, the underlying strength that we're seeing among shoppers uh, of the builders. So at Zonda, we've got some really interesting data that looks at what the builders are seeing uh, in terms of like foot traffic and cancellations. And we, obviously, we care about that because we care about the operations of the builders. Uh, but let me just show you a few things. So this line is the conversion rate. So the quality of builder foot traffic from 2006, 20, I'm sorry, 2016 to 2019. So that pre-pandemic area. This is the, the average weekly read. Here is the line of the boom period, 2020 to 2022 builder traffic conversion. So people who came in to shop builders, whatever the foot traffic was, they came in and they were serious. They wanted to buy. Here's the line for 2023. So I'll note that for a decent part of this year, although foot traffic itself was down, the quality was super, super high. People wanted to get into a different, better home. And most recently, inside of the last month, we've seen actually the quality of the foot traffic uh, exceed what was normal, even during the boom period. Uh, we saw a similar story play out for cancellation rates. Obviously, uh, cancellation rates, here's the, the pre-pandemic -can pre cancellation rate average. Here's the can rate average during the boom period which includes <laughs> last year when we had these big increases in mortgage rates, as well as the initial volatility that happened in 2020. Here's the cancellation rate to start this year. So we saw really bad cancellation rate numbers to start the year when mortgage rates were increasing very, very rapidly. But right now, along with the quality story for home shoppers, we're seeing actually pretty good numbers, which implies, just like we saw on the pro-contractor backlog, uh, uh, evidence for price stability. Uh, for building products and perhaps for housing too. We have a whole econ team that spends time thinking about that. Uh, that's interesting. Uh, so I want to just touch on a few things related to the pull forward debate. So when I hear people talk about pull forward, uh, usually the, the story goes that they look at overall levels of spending and compared to the kind of historic norm level of GDP, pull, there, there's so much spending going on within home improvement that it must revert to the norm. And I, I, I get the intuition on that. 
But I want to just challenge that idea with one data point. Here's something to think about. So if we look at free financial crisis, share of rem remodeling spending that was driven by these really, really big projects, like over $50,000 on your home, pre-financial crisis during the boom era, it was about 48%. Okay. Uh, from that point to today, look at the share of remodeling spending. This is from uh, the raw microdata from the Census America, the American Housing Survey. So it's every other year we have this and we have an estimate of where we think it is right now. But even in 2021, the share of remodels uh, that was being driven by these really large projects, 50K or more, of course, adjusting for inflation, uh, really was not that large. It was nowhere near where it was in 2005 to 2007. In fact, it was slightly down from where it was in 2019, which is really interesting because when we talk about pull forward, we would expect if it was all pull forward, it to be at least larger than where it was in 2019 because 2019 was certainly not a pull forward year. And we can just make the remark here that the increase in homeowner uh, equity has just drastically grown from where it was in the financial crisis uh, well beyond where it was in 2019. And yet we really haven't seen the level of spending uh, anywhere near where it would have been uh, causing us to raise a flag about pull forward. So our sense is that most of the really expensive projects, obviously there has been some pull forward, but it's not in the 50K plus projects. That's the story. So when we think about which projects are deferred, uh, there's this festering pool of big remodels that we think is undergoing uh, most pro more postponement right now uh, but it's going to happen. And just for example, one, one way I think about this, <laughs> this is a great image. This is a real image. Uh, I think CNBC featured this home uh, in 2021. Do you remember when people were buying homes and there was such a shortage of resale homes that you'd get a home that lists over the weekend and 30 people would descend on site and they would basically try to outbid one another. They didn't have time to check the school district or really have, uh, they, they'd waive inspections in a lot of cases. They weren't as worried about getting the perfect home. They just wanted to get a home because otherwise they would be outbid by 20 other people and they wouldn't have any home at all. So the reason I'm bringing this up, this is not an environment to shop for homes and get exactly the perfect home that fits your household or your family. We think one of the issues that's driving deferral is that people have purchased homes in the last few years and essentially got a very poor fit and now they're stuck. So just for an example, here's, here's some data uh, to consider. Um, we did a, a study, some primary research, looking at satisfaction of homeowners uh, in a variety of circumstances, as well as their, their plans for future remodels. Uh, one of the big conclusions we had was we, we looked at calculating net promoter scores, which is an okay metric. We can, we can you know, make, make cases for it, uh, both good and bad. But just for comparison, net promoter scores by how long they've been in their home. So this orange dot here, is the net promoter score of people who have been in their home over 10 years, minus 10. It's not a great score, okay? But compare that with the net promoter score of people that were in their home, uh, say, two to 10 years, who bought a home more recently. They've got some equity run-up. Maybe they got a little bit better fit. They like their homes, especially those who bought their homes six to 10 years ago, and they're not planning on moving. They might continue to improve it. Here, the green dot is is the promoter score for those who purchased after 2020. Now that's super interesting. Uh, these people purchased a home conceivably to make their life better. They are not happy with the home that they got, which means, and now they're stuck. They bought this home likely too quickly. They didn't do their due diligence. And now they have a choice of either trying to move, but they've got a higher mortgage rate, or they have to remodel, or they have to do both at some point. Uh, part of it also is interesting. We, we look at some of the other neighborhood statistics there's some really interesting data from the census that looks at uh, the reason why people move or don't move, the reason behind mobility. And one of the questions that I like to look at is the percentage of movers who move because of crime. This number doesn't move around a whole lot year to year, but look what it did since 2020 and 2021. So this is like a three to four standard deviation swing. It's an enormous move uh, in the last few years, indicating that the people who were moving were those who had found some issue with their neighborhood safety-wise. They're worried about their safety. It's not the number I would worry about here. It's a small base. It's the degree of the swing, which is an important point. Uh, not everyone can move, by the way. This tends to be those who have income who are trying to find a different home. Uh, other people may still be dissatisfied with their neighborhood and they face crime, but they're not able to move, which makes it a deferral. Here's one more. If you're not looking at this data, this is a great piece. We touched on this. 
Uh, so the New York Federal Reserve does some interesting survey work. One of the surveys that I really uh, enjoy looking at is this little data point, the percentage of homeowners who expect to move again within the next two years. Uh, this is the cut of homeowners under 50 years old. Okay, this number doesn't move around much year to year. From 2017 to 2018 to 2019, you can see it was almost virtually the same number. But look what happened from 2022 to 2023. Uh, it didn't just go up, but like the, the underlying uh, number regarding safety, these are people who didn't move yet, but they're planning on moving as soon as they can. Uh, we've seen it more than double. Largest swing and largest level in the history of the data. Low resale inventory, plus a surge in household formation since 2020, plus this strained affordability means you have many people who are stu stuck in homes that it's just not the ideal fit. So the, either it's a postponed move or it's a remodel, but these uh, people who are planning to move, that did not change uh, once mortgage rates went back up. Now it's a question of, it, th these are the things that tend to fester, of just when they choose to act, will they move or will they remodel? Uh, here's one more. Not that we need more, but we and we have many more. We just don't have time. Let's talk about the impact of having children. Now, when, when I bring up to having children, most people think about the birth rate. Birth rates have been going down since 2007 and by a, a decent amount. Um, but it's not the overall birth rate that I think we should worry about, especially if we're trying to forecast uh, building products and home improvement or housing. Uh, what we should think about is who is having the babies and who spends on housing. So here's the birth rate pre-pandemic 2019 by age of mother, uh, kind of by, we see the normal sequential growth. Most people have their babies between 25 and 39, skewed kind of in the middle of that range. When 2020 first hit, across the board, birth rates dropped in every single age cohort. This is for the average of the year. Uh, then 2021 and 2022 occurred, and we basically saw a mixed bag. There were some cohorts, like those under 24, which continue to have pretty severe declines in the birth rate. Uh, however, home improvement spending and housing spending is not driven by people under 2024 in, 20, in the year 2023. Uh, it's driven by older households who have access to credit, who have money, and who are in their peak earning years. And so the reason that's interesting to me, as we think about uh, postponing you know, these deferred projects or these pull forward, is that if I have children, perhaps you have children, or you're aware of people who have children. If you had a baby in 2021 or 2022, I would suggest to you that your spending is not pulled forward at all. In fact, it's just getting started. And we know that the levels of spending, if you take a household and do nothing else, we have data on this from the Bureau of Labor Statistics, the Consumer Expenditure Survey. If you do, do nothing else with the household, except just give that couple a child, and I'm using saying couple here just because it allows us to compare uh, like like for like earning power. If you do nothing else but give that couple a child, that household spending on housing as a category jumps by 32%. And what goes in the home, furniture, home improvements, increases as a relative share. And it's not a one-year thing or a two-year thing. We People used to get so excited about existing home sales because existing home sales drove like a 30% increase in remodeling spending for two years. This goes on for 18 years, and it sticks even after that, even after that family or that, that person moves out. So what I'm suggesting here is that you've got a number of structural factors that are really, really fundamental and important for home improvement and housing spending, and only a small, small amount of them actually have any evidence of being uh, pulled forward. That's largely played out. What's being deferred right now are things like spending on your children on updating your home to, to fit your family's needs which almost none of that uh, has been handled already. So that being said, I'm going to pass it over to Matt Samson, who's going to talk about the great uh, channel reorder. Uh, Matt, go ahead. Thank you, Todd, and uh, welcome, everyone. So let's start out with our, uh, our baseline scorecard here. This chart demonstrates at a high level the major channel flows we've been analyzing all year. So time flows left to right, and we have channels that are both gaining and then some that are losing at the product category level. So first takeaway here is you notice how much the streams here consolidate as you go left to right. Both lumber yards and specialty dealers are consistently gaining and e-commerce is growing rapidly. 
And a lot of these gains are at the expense of big box, uh, which was really a haven for pros during pandemic. Um, long hours, still maintained staff, um, we're, we're getting product, leaning harder than anyone on the suppliers. But now, now that we are in a period of more normalcy, we see pros shifting away and, uh, and you know, they're as pro requirements um, kind of rise and reset to where they were pre-pandemic, um, they're finding big box just is not, uh, is not sufficiently uh, cutting it. So we regularly ask contractors um, how readily their proposals are being accepted um, versus receiving homeowner pushback. And uh, as Todd explained earlier, we calculate a ratio of this. Um, high number is bad. It's the number of uh, pushback proposals over accepted proposals. And all year, the pushback ratio has been growing. Um, but we have seen that there's um, some real differences at the product level. So this is basically taking all those different product categories Todd showed earlier and kind of rolling them into three levels. And so first, um, exterior improvements. Um, on the nice list, there's basically almost one exterior improvement project accepted for everyone that is pushed back. So it's, uh, it's pushback ratio is right around one. Kitchen and baths fall in the middle. And then whole house remodel, uh, gut job proposals, these are the biggest jobs that we, that we measure and really that are, that are conducted on a, uh, you know, on the, um, by contractors. And so whole house remodels, um, those proposals are really being accepted at a rate of less than one per three proposals presented. So quite low. And as Todd said earlier, um, not only are the numbers quite different based on project scale, but they're also going in different directions. Exterior improvements um, is getting lower the pushback ratio, and um, whole house remodels on the other end of the spectrum is is getting higher. And so as uh, as you know, contract work kind of normalizes. We're seeing more and more differentiation of what uh, what the homeowners are accepting from a proposal standpoint. Matt, let me let me throw this out there too. Um... Yeah, go ahead, Todd. And and and, and this is such a. I, I know you know we only had room for so many slides here, but I couldn't help but think last week. Uh, so Home Depot had their investor day, and of course all these you know slides kind of outline their plans for growth and what they're seeing. One of the slides that really struck me was just how much of uh, kind of their overall market like value value picture driven by pro contractor share gains. So that slide that you showed before that showed individual product categories kind of flowing, you know, through big box and then out of big box into other categories. Is it fair to say we've, we've seen a pretty different slowdown in the, the type of contractors that uh, we're shopping at, like maybe big box would have captured in 2021 and 2022. And that that's what you're alluding to here is really shifted. Yeah. I mean, great question. I think we're seeing, um, we're seeing the kind of those prosumer type of contractors. Um, you know, maybe they uh, maybe they're doing contracting part time. They have another job that's three or four days a week, and they also contract. Maybe have this, they have the summer off from their full time jobs. So they also contract on the side. You know, big box. Um, you know, like hardware stores has always had a, a strong hold on those smaller. Um, you know, sometimes journeyman contractors. But I think we saw during uh, during the pandemic that all contractors, you know, all different types of pickup trucks um, in the depot, uh, you know, in the depot parking lot for a while there. And, you know, and we know that the the depot and Lowe's are, um, you know, amongst the biggest and maybe the best at, uh, you know, sort of standing on suppliers, making sure they have suitable inventory and, you know, and obviously the stores are everywhere. There's a real convenience factor there. Um, and I think for a period of time, um, everyone's, all the pros expectations, you know, were kind of a little bit lower, just like you were saying earlier, Todd, you know, during that period, homeowners were happier, happy to get a contractor in their house. Well, you know, that contractor they got was happy to get probably almost any brand of product they could, you know, as long as they could pick it up now and do it, you know, and, and get to the job site and, and conduct that job. But, you know, that subsistence level farming can only last so long, you know, now we're seeing contractors start to raise their game again. They're requiring staff knowledge. They're requiring higher service level, better delivery, things that, 
you know, the depot is really suffering uh, versus some of their, uh, you know, the, their pro channel competition. Right. These are well, 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 well run businesses, but this is the, 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 the supply chain tightness and the pricing environment is no longer 2021. So we're seeing a little bit of reversion back to, um, I'll let you keep, keep, keep going. This is super interesting. Yeah. So, um, let's, uh, let's go on to this next page here. So basically, um, you know, the high levels of pushback, as we were saying, really drive contractors to, to find lower costs so they can compete and still make money. And one way they'll do that, of course, is to shop around more. And so what we're seeing here, the number one and the number two are, um, are pushback ratios. So two, again, is um, two proposals pushed back um, to be reworked or, or worse for everyone that's accepted. That's a lot worse than one, which is a one-to-one -one acceptance rate. So the folks who are struggling here a little bit more, the, the contractors who are showing a pushback ratio of two, 77% of them um, say that they are shifting their purchases to other channels. Now you compare that to the contractors with a pushback ratio of one, whose proposals are accepted a lot more readily, they're only at a 71% um, kind of channel shifting. So we're seeing about a 6% bump in, uh, you know, in these contractors who are looking for better prices um, you know, are, are looking more widely with their shopping in order to do that. And that's really important because it means there's a lot of contractors um, kind of on the street shopping around and bringing large scale jobs. But at the same time, they're also bringing jobs that they're looking for bargains on. They're, they're looking for tighter costs. So, so yes, more, you know, more potential purchases coming in the door, but, you know, but not maybe not at the, uh, the margins you necessarily want to sell at or the products with the highest margins. So contractors share their year-on-year -year margin changes with us, and they're expressed here in basis points or BIPs, so the change from, uh, from last year to this year. So one group was enjoying actually margin accretion increase of um, almost 150 BIPs, uh, or more than 150 BIPs, a percent and a half year-on-year. -year. And the common thread amongst them was they were the group that was actually most loyal to brands. They were switching the least. Conversely, we have the group that switch brands the most, the ones who are really chasing costs the most actively, and their margins are almost two full percentage points lower than those brand loyals on the bottom. Significant difference. The trick here is, right, is that we don't know what came first, brand switching or reduced margins. Um, we do believe that a good deal of the switching, though, is a reaction to margin pressure. Again, that proposal pushback you know, forcing them to go out and find less expensive options. And, and to that point, you know, this really demonstrates the roles for both sticky, resilient brands that, um, that pros do not want to switch off of. And then kind of those upstart or private label brands, you know, might not, might not be getting all of the quality and sort of brand value to that your, that your customer wants, but, you know, but the ability to, um, to possibly save some save some short term cost, which uh, which you know appears to be what a lot of people are looking for right now. So on the last slide, you saw we crossed over from channel shifting to brand shifting. These are up often topics that are discussed um, as discrete activities. In our eyes, though, they really can't be separated because in the end channels carry different products. Uh, no brand has 100% distribution or even 100% awareness for that matter. So let, let's dig into this and why it's significant. So here we ask builders and contractors where their loyalty lies, brand, to the brand, which is all the way to the left, or to the channel, which is all the way to the right. And it's pretty much, and we had them do it on a sliding scale. So it might be 100% brand, 0% channel, 40% brand, 60%, et cetera. And, and it was a uh, kind of sliding left to right here. And so what we found, it was pretty much a dead heat. The, the mean, the median, the mode were all at 50%. So by far the most popular answer and almost a fairly normal distribution here was half to the brand, half to the channel, a little wishy-washy, right? However, it is kind of an interesting tell though that if you look at the second most popular answer after 50-50, 50, 
it's 100% loyal to the channel. So there is a pretty large cohort here saying all of my loyalty goes to the channel. So this this so, potentially is a big deal, right? Because because what you're describing yes. here is a setup where the big I'm just you know re refine this statement, but I think this is important for us to clarify. We've got this situation where pro contractors become kind of the the battleground for home improvement spending. And you have con you have channels that are kind of committing themselves to winning pro contractor share. And what we're learning is that a lot of the pro contractors, when the rubber meets the road, tell us that they're willing to walk away from the brand and rather be loyal to the channel. So when you're thinking about potential implications of design reviews or line reviews, uh, maybe stickiness of private label versus non-private label, this completely changes the cadence of like where that discussion goes. I think of it as a really big deal, honestly, Todd, because, you know, and in its most sort of quote unquote fair sense, you could say, okay, if a channel, you know, if I'm a, if I'm a siding manufacturer, say, um, I make vinyl siding and the channels that particular channels not doing or, or, or even pro dealer or retailer is not doing a good job at vinyl siding, contractor is going to go somewhere else and, you know, they may or may not find my siding in this new place they're going. Maybe you say, I'll take that hit because the channel's my partner. We chose to work together and, you know, like for like, they're going to get my siding somewhere else. But what about that same contractor? If you're a roofing manufacturer, they might have left a pro dealer or a lumber yard because they were unhappy with the siding, with the siding experience. They needed a different siding. But what if suddenly the one they go to doesn't carry my roofing? Like we, I had nothing to do with that exchange, but suddenly I'm scrambling to hold on to that contractor's business because he went somewhere else because almost all of these contractors aren't buying, you know, one or two categories from these channels. They're buying multiple categories. So I think the real danger or risk, Todd, is that you can get caught up in that crossfire and almost be collateral damage, if that makes sense. Yeah, that's a big deal. So, so, so we're at the pivot point right now where we're just beginning to see some of these backlogs slow down. We're just beginning to see uh, kind of this unwind of pro contractors that had shifted to the big box retailers just because the big box retailers were so good at procurement and pricing. And now we're kind of seeing a reordering of why they go where they go. And and, and the, the collateral damage is going to be the products that we were placed at one and not both. And so we could see some kind of additional shoes to drop in the building product space based on who's got exposure where. Yeah, absolutely. And if you're not one of those really sticky brands that a pro is going to say, you know what, I'm going to make an extra stop to get that siding because no matter what, I'm, I'm getting my certainty siding. I, I don't care if the place that I go doesn't carry it. It's just that important to me. But you can count on two hands, you know, how many categories really have that level of stickiness. Most are fairly, inter most brands are fairly interchangeable, which we'll, which we'll see in a minute here. But this 50-50 on this slide, I think is a little wishy-washy. I think we made it a little too easy to answer that question. And so they said, ah, I'm, about, I'm about equally loyal to both, right? So we forced the issue and we, we asked it a different way. We said, okay, so if you were going to switch brands, what would it be due to? And this is where it kind of got a little little scary, honestly, they pick the channel almost two to one over the brand. So if you're going to switch a brand, you kind of expect it to be because I want a different brand. No, this shows most people say because I'm shopping somewhere else. And if a, you know, if I have to switch brands along the way, that's, that's just part of the story because the channel is really my priority. I'm buying multiple products there that drives the cost. I'm facing push. I'm facing, you know, that rough pushback ratio. I need to control my costs. And and hey, if I've got a, if I have to switch brands along the way, so be it. Um, and so suddenly, that difference between is it is it channel switching or is it brand switching? That line gets very blurry. And so, why does that matter? Um, well, we we wanted to try to understand the potential impact on brands that these channel shifts can can cause. There's a lot going on in this in this chart here. So I ask everyone to stick with me for a moment and I, uh, I, I promise I'll get you through it pretty readily. So on the left, purple line, this is the consideration set. So this is basically um, the pros 
average brand consideration by category, meaning the number of brands that they kind of switch in between for different jobs. It varies by category, but you can see it's pretty darn low. It's, it's generally average less than two and a half. So it's rare that they're, you know, in only one case here, lighting, are they switching um, to amongst more than three brands? And then on the right, not only did we ask them how many brands do you typically use in a year, but we, but we also said, how many of you are adding new brands or subtracting brands? And we actually saw that a good amount of them are adding brands this year. Now, you know, kind of do the math in your head. If on average, a consideration set is only two and a half brands and you're a manufacturer of one of these products, someone adding a brand to that set is actually quite significant. And suddenly, suddenly there's a real risk of dilution that I have to my sales. And so we kind of racked and stacked these categories left to right, because really the biggest risk is when you have a small consideration set. So you're in a, uh, you're a brand that, um, you know, that is used at a pretty high level by pros because they're only switching amongst say two or at most three in the category. But then when that brand um, with the low consideration set meets a high level of brands being added, suddenly you run, you're, you run at a real risk here. And so left to right, we kind of look at the, it's a ratio of the percent of brands that are being added net. So we're taking out the subtracts are being added divided by the number of brands in a consideration set. And suddenly you see products like lighting, flooring, roofing, are at a, a real chance of dilution. So let's take flooring as an example. So look on the left, average consideration set, kind of right down the middle, about two and a half. That, that says contractors use about two and a half different flooring brands in the course of their year. Then go to the right axis. That 25 is that 25% of pros are saying they're adding one or more brands to their, to their, to their flooring kind of repertoire of consideration set. So suddenly, if I'm one of those two and a half and a quarter of pros are adding a brand, I, I'm, I'm at some real risk of losing, of losing sales to that new brand. And why are they adding new brands? Because as they move around, as pros move around and they get bumped into different channels looking for cost savings, well, suddenly not all of the flooring brands are going to be present in every channel. You know, they're, they're, they're going to find, to find outages and, you know, and, and that's where you know, that's where a brand gets a shot to get into the, the consideration set. So this is a recipe for market share shift. That's how I read this, right? Uh, for everything you just said, this is, this is a recipe for, uh, think of your building product companies, how predictable they've been over the last few, you know, three years. And then think of just shaking up the crystal ball of all the different uh, kind of overlays of who has what share where and a bunch of categories, uh, Lose, lose share to substitution brands and get diluted. And another ones have huge wins. Because if you were a hedge fund, this is a recipe for like big differences between winners and losers. Yeah, absolutely. It's very important to, I think, understand, um, understand you know, the, 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 these products that you've been invested in. How are people, how sticky are people, you know, are these brands to the pros? Will they readily switch? Because it, it's it's really hard not to switch when you are being you know sort of forced to shop around more and more and cut costs. It 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 it's a lot easier to switch than to not. Um, and and so it it takes work. It takes that extra stop in order to uh, you know to essentially pick up your product at times. And so at the last um, the last webinar we did a couple of months back, we introduced this brand commitment metric. Um, and we did it to, to demonstrate brand stickiness or resilience. Um, and hopefully today kind of reinforces why it really matters right now. You know, when channel shifting is rampant, you really want to be in this upper right quadrant versus the lower left, because that means you have high awareness, um, the y-axis here, which trends very directly with distribution levels. You know, one of the main reasons beyond marketing that awareness is strong is because your product is found everywhere. So if you're 
product is found in, you know, 30, 40, 50% distribution levels, then you have a much higher chance that as the pro gets bumped around, they're not going to see your product there anymore. And that's where the other factor, commitment on the x-axis really matters. And that's basically, you know, it's kind of like a loyalty measure that, you know, the, the, when you look at the pro's purchases, how much they are going to purchase your brand within their category. And so if that's really low and awareness is really low, um, as Todd said, that that's a recipe for real, uh, you know, real potential share impact that you're, uh, that you're facing. Um, so that's all I've got. Uh, thanks again for uh, spending some time with us this afternoon. And I'm going to hand you uh, back to Todd. Yeah, so just to recap, I want to touch these conclusions that we touched on earlier this year and just make a comment. So our recap, originally we had said near term that we thought risks to building products were going to increase, get cumulatively worse by the second half of 2023. Uh, that still seems to be true. Uh, backlogs are at a level lower than what we had at the beginning of the year, especially on the new construction side, but also on the home improvement side. Pricing appears to have stabilized. Now, both backlogs and pricing are better than where they were two months ago, but the level is low enough that it's no longer a buffer. So now we're more at risk at some of those macro factors bleeding through tightening credit, tightening incomes, uh, bleeding through to slowdowns in the second half of this year. Our forecast right now is between minus seven and minus 9% for BP spending. Uh, I'll mention this. If you want the detailed buildup by type of construction and by scale, well, you have to be a client to get that. So if you're a client, go ahead and reach out and we'll provide that to you. Uh, if not, uh, this would be at least an, an update on what we're thinking. On um, longer term, what we had said before was this is going to be the golden age of remodeling. That's a comment about the increased levels of home improvement spending. That still seems to be the case. And the more we learn about the underlying backdrop of deferral, the more compelling that story gets. And the precedent is for deferral. So we, we have to basically establish the list of conditions that we have to see now in front of us before that deferral begins, and then try to identify which categories are going to happen first and what the order is going to be. But we had the shifts in birth rate. We've had this kind of postponed mismatching with housing. We've got all these other issues with people trying to find different homes, and they're kind of stuck in their homes, and it's a poor fit of them. Uh, as well as the obvious things like aging housing stock and people at the right life stage and some of these other issues that are going on, uh, like roofing I'll pick on too. Really interesting story there. Don't get complacent on those product pricing or supply chain. If someone tells you it's fixed, it's what they mean is it's fixed at the current lower level of demand. It may not be fixed if we see a rebound. If we saw a 20% rebound uh, because of deferral, it's not fixed. Uh, there's a whole bunch of other implications there. And then as Matt mentioned, we talked about this before, that the recipe was the case before, that there was going to be this divergence in results between channels and brands. We're beginning to see that now unfold. And where it's unfolding is in what's happening with pro-contractors. Uh, a whole bunch of pro-contractors, according to the data that we have, uh, we've got almost 2 million pro-contractors that we work with at Zonda, and a number of them share really interesting information with us. Uh, had gone to the big box retailers because they were just so well-run businesses and they had done you know, superior procurement and pricing. What we're seeing now is that it's a different environment than it was in 2022. And so they're beginning to shop at other locations. In some cases, the service levels of these you know, traditional distribution or specialty dealers is really high quality. That means though, that some of the products and brands that sell by these other forms of distribution uh, are, are going to take share from others, and there's increased risk of brand dilution and substitution. So uh, I am very bullish on building products in the long term. I also think there's tremendous opportunity for big differences in spreads between the top performers and poor performers, far bigger, we think, especially with destocking than what uh, you know kind of is consensus view right now. So it's exciting times in home improvement. Uh, lastly, if you'd like more information on us, uh, go ahead and subscribe to our emails for upcoming webinars. Here's our contact information if you want our individual contact information. There's a survey after the close of this webinar. If you want more details, go ahead and fill out the survey and we'll get in touch with you. Uh, but thank you again. Uh, and if there's any questions, uh, you can go ahead and either submit those now or send it to us by means of email. Uh, thank you for joining us. Have a great day.